So in this paper, we try to think about uh, the implication of bad health over the entire life cycle. And I want to start by showing you uh, some, some empirical facts. So what we did to, to show these facts, uh, we have separated people into two groups. In particular, we separated into two groups, uh, uh, men with high school degree. Uh, and the two groups are healthy and unhealthy, where we define healthy person if he uh, self-report his health being excellent, very good, and good. And we define unhealthy person or bad health person if his self-reported health is fair or poor. So then we look at the economic outcomes. And, and by the way, this classification into very good, uh, into bad and good health is going to be carried on, carry, because carried through the entire paper. It's very standard classification. So when we compare the economic outcome, what we see, healthy on average earn almost 40% more than unhealthy and uh, conditional and working. And uh, if you look at the pre-retirement wealth, healthy have almost uh, more than 60% more wealth than unhealthy. This raised two important questions. The first question is why? Why do we see such a big uh, difference in economic outcome by health? Uh, even Please uh, remember, it's a very homogeneous group of people. So these are all males, all same education. It, even within this group, group we see a quite a big difference in economic outcome by health. And second, given this large difference, how costly it is to be unhealthy over the entire life cycle. So overall, how we can think about the interaction of health and economic outcome. Uh, so there are three channels. The first channel is health can affect economic outcome. The second channel is that economic outcome can affect health. And the third channel is that maybe it's not a direct effect of one on the other, but because people are just different. Those people who we observe as healthy and healthy, they can be different in some certain innate characteristics. So uh, all three channels are rec uh, recognized in the literature and um, a model, but the third channel is kind of most overlooked channel. So it's either not modeled typically in structural papers or modeled in a rather simplistic way. So what do we do in this paper? We combine channel one, uh, basically health is exogenous and affects economic outcome with a very detailed investigation of the channel three. And let me tell you a, a little bit more about the channel three. So what is channel three? Why people can be different between healthy and unhealthy group? So, well, we know people are different, people are born different, people have different uh, childhood experiences, different personality traits and so forth. And recently, there is a growing empirical papers uh, showing that this, what we call fixed extant characteristic, we macro people, something that is pretty much fixed by the time you become adult and enter the labor market. So there is a growing empirical evidence that this fixed extant characteristic actually matter over the entire life cycle. So, for example, what happened to you when were you still a child, or what happened to you even when you were just born or even conceived, matter even when you're already retired. And uh, I list some papers here. It's very far from being the full list. We have a more detailed literature review of this issue in, in, the, in the paper, but it's very uh, interesting branch of literature. They very convincingly argue for these effects are there, these effects are important. And what we do, we incorporate those effects in the structural framework. So basically, we allow people to be different ex ante in certain fixed characteristics. They are multidimensional and they're possibly correlated among each other, which is, which is quite important. Okay, so what we do? There are two parts in this paper. The first part uh, is empirical part. We estimate this health, um, we estimate this health shock process. So remember, we uh, look at health as exogenous process which affects economic outcomes so is very important to really capture how this health evolves. And uh, we actually go to the data, we document several facts, some of which are actually quite new, uh, in particular related to duration dependent of, uh, dependence of health. And then we formulate and estimate a health shock process that is consistent with these facts. And I will tell, of course, much more about this later, but the key finding that we have that an important driver of evolution of health is fixed ex ante heterogeneity. What we call in this paper, throughout this paper, health type. So controlling even for very long history dependence or duration dependence, these health types are important. So this is part one 
of the paper. And part two, we study the interaction of health and economic outcome in a structural uh, model. Where well, basically what we do, and of course I give you more detail later, we allow for three-dimensional heterogeneity among people, which is fixed ex ante. These include this health type I just mentioned, fixed labor productivity, and patients, and uh, we estimate the correlation among them. And moreover, we show this correlation is important to account for the interaction of health and economic outcome. Finally, we use this paper to quantify the lifetime cost of bad health. So <clears throat> we use three data sets for the study, which is health, health and retirement study, panel study of income dynamics, and medical expenditure panel survey data set. And uh, let me just move straight to the health process estimation. So uh, I, I want to start with these facts, which are relatively new. And uh, let me go through these graphs uh, a little bit slower. But this graph constructed for people between the ages of 55 to 69. In the paper, we have also a graph for other age groups. Here, we just choose to show this particular graph because we can compare HRS and PSID. So here, the darker shades in both graphs is HRS, the, the lighter shade is PSID. And um, uh, let us focus for the sake of this presentation on HRS graph, PSID, Tell, tell, tell the same story. So what is this graph? This graph shows duration-dependent transition probabilities. And uh, they are two-period transition, uh, two-year transition. So one period here is two years. It's the same group, high school men. So for example, let us look at the left-hand side graph. So here we have a transition probability from bad to good health. So this is probability to recover conditional on how many periods you already spent in the currently bad, in the current health status, which is bad. For example, take a person with the first bar here. If you look at the person who has been absorbed in bad health status for at most one period, at least one period, his probability to recover is above 30%. If you look at the same person, but who has been in bad health, who, whom we observe in bad health for at least two periods, uh, he uh, his probability drops to 20%. If you look at the person whom we observe for the three periods, his probability to drop to maybe 15% or so, and so forth. With each year you add that you observe a person to be unhealthy, his probability drops. The longer you are in bad health, the less likely you are to move out. Now, if you think about this graph, this is not a story of a one process. And I want you to remind you that in uh, micro health literature, this uh, AI1 process become, uh, modeling health as AI1 process become a mainstream. So uh, this is not AI1 process. This is not even AI2 process, actually. It's, it's something more complex. If you look at the uh, second graph on the right hand side, it's a similar story here, but this is transition from good to bad health. So this is probability to uh, relapse bad and bad, bad health condition, how many periods you already held. Again, let us focus on HRS. Uh, Bar, if you have been observed in good health for at least one period, your probability to relapse is more than uh, 10%. It drops to under 10% if you manage to hold on to good health status for at least two years. And then, same story after this, with each subsequent period, you are doing better in terms of prob uh, probability to relapse going down. Again, not an AR1. Uh, no, oh. Yeah. Would you part of what's driving the Mm -hmm. the pattern is that there's more heterogeneity in the spins than what the self-reported health. Yeah, I, I will go there just in a second. Yeah, I, I, just this slide straight into my eyes, so um, I, I will wear sunglasses. Not for intimidation purposes, but <laughs> um, okay. So let me just answer your question. It's, it's a very good point. So. Exactly. What can account for this pattern? So AR1 process, AR2 process cannot account. What can account? Well, first, it can be AR many period process, very long duration dependence. It can be heter fixed six anti heterogeneity. People um, may be just different. They are innately different in how they recover, how they get sick. So that's why you see this pattern. And the last one, that's what Karen uh, just mentioned, uh, it is that this bad health, what, what the self report is bad health, may have some heterogeneity, that some diseases are, are worse than others. So what actually we do, um, that we formulate a health process where we actually incorporate um, this, all three mechanisms. So in particular, we allow for history dependence, 
uh, which we call tau, and it can be BLG, depending on better good health. We are talking about history of bad or good health. Uh, we allow for fixed ex ante heterogeneity, which we call health type eta, and uh, also to, to, to incorporate this possible difference in bad health state. Uh, actually, remember how we define bad health state. We are uh, basically people who self-report themselves in a fair house or poor house. That's what we call bad state. But we allow now for difference in transition probability for these two uh, health states. So specifically, let me let me show you that uh, that even maybe makes more sense once you see it in the model. So we formulated our health uh, transition as an ordered logic model. So here, what do we have? So let us consider individual whose current health status is HT, is either poor or fair. Then uh, his probability to stay in this poor health state next period, at T plus one, uh, still poor, is this logit function, which has three components. The first component, uh, F, this is H polynomial. And notice it indexed by H, so depending on whether you are in poor or fair health, your, your, this coefficient are different. Well, plus they account for the general pattern that people get a, a difference uh, as they, they get older, they get less likely to, to be healthy. The second component here is duration dependence component, what we call. So here, it's a set of dummy variable for how many periods we observe you in a particular health state. So in tau b, uh, how many periods we observe you in a, in a bad health state. So we, here we aggregate a poor and fair health together due to the number of observations for the history. And we uh, cap this history at the largest history dependence of cap t. So we do not allow for history dependence larger than t, and then we estimate two different versions of, of this t. And the final part is health type, which we model as um, as a dummy variable with, with index eta. So this is uh, which health type you are in, essentially. So the rest of this equation um, pretty much have the same structure. So to do like a time, I'll just go through once, but basically same structure everywhere, each polynomial, uh, duration dependence part and health type. Another important part of this, of course, is that health type is unobservable. So we have to also have this health type prediction equation here, which we have formulated as you see here in the green panel. It's a logic model of being a particular health type. We allow for three health types. So it's a three discrete point, eta one, eta two, eta three. Eta one is the worst one. Eta three is the best one. And so probability to be uh, of the worst health type, eta one, is basically uh, uh, depends on some observables, vector of observable x with some coefficient b. And this vector of observable x is recorded as of time t0. The time t0 is the first age at which we observe an individual in our data. And here at the bottom of the slide, we list what are these observables. But uh, what I want especially to stress out among this is fixed labor productivity. So what we did here, so we have estimated this fixed labor productivity using a standard approach by running a fixed effect regression of uh, labor earning on a set of uh, age and health variables. And then we estimated this gamma and we discretized it into three groups based on which tercile you are in. We call you gamma L, gamma M, or gamma H. If you're in the lowest tercile, middle tercile, and highest tercile of the fixed labor productivity distribution, and we allow this to predict health. So let me show some results. So the first result, which we think is very important, and I want to really stress it, uh, is that health type is always important. Even if we allow the longest history dependence, we allow is eight lagged years. And even if you allow for such a long history dependence, we still find health type methods. So health type is important. Another important result is that health type and this fixed labor productivity are correlated. So here we uh, report, so this table reports the joint distribution of eta and gamma, uh, fixed labor productivity. And this is all the results I'm going to show you, this one and the next one, are for, for t equals 3, which corresponds to four lagged year history dependence, because that's what we're going to put in the model. I mean, putting in the model eight lag like history dependence is not really manageable. So, uh, but uh, I mean, the, the similar story emerges from other lag dependence as well. So, what you see here is, yeah, John. Uh, just to be clear, the fixed labor productivity 
it, that's using labor observation the entire life cycle, or is it only a backwards looking measure? Okay, so we're, 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 we're creating, constructing the process for health, you know, from T0 to cap T or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, what period of that, what period of that time is the fixed labor productivity being estimated? Is it being estimated over the same period that, the, that we're trying to, uh, try to forecast health evolution? Yeah. So, I mean, we just, we observe individual for certain number of periods. We estimate health process based on those observation and we estimate fixed productivity based on those observations. So, so to add it, um, basically the same samples that we use to construct the health models, the same samples that we use to construct the health models, the same samples that we use to construct the health models, the same samples that we use to construct the health models, the same samples that we use to construct the health models. Okay, yeah, uh, it's just, yeah, it's an interesting filtration problem because presumably, right, because uh, you're using Productivity is based on future health outcomes as well. The measure of your measure of productivity. Well, again, so if you say, like, remember, we kind of rule out channel two. So that's, you can think of this as identifying as option. If you say, okay, there can be some cross, uh, like, the, the, the effect, like, your productivity, your wealth, or whatever other variables affect, uh, probably th that's not the way you should do it. Definitely. That, that's, we actually, at this point, we are not sure. We think it's very important to understand. If you incorporate all three channels and you really want to be serious about channel three and also allow for the channel two, how exactly to proceed with identification, we are still not sure. But that definitely should be more complex than just that's definitely there. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I guess the question will be is what exactly is being approached in this function? Well, that, that, that this, yes. So okay. Uh, I'm not sure I fully follow things, but but I like, it sounds like you're, you're speaking at the fixed labor productivity type using future earning dynamics because you're estimating that was cool. I mean, but we assume health, health, health uh, you, it cannot be affected. Health is not affected by your labor productivity. Health. No, I know, but what I'm, what I'm, I guess my question is simpler. Is that if you're going to use future earnings to predict, to determine fixed labor productivity, why not use future health dynamics to determine your fixed health type? Why only use the initial? No, no, but, but it just, it's not, but this is just part of the same estimation, right? So when you estimate, you have to write uh, the maximum uh, lock, uh, max uh, lock. Yeah, I just, I, in the previous slide, you were saying that you... you yeah, yeah, but it's part of this. No, no, it's just together. It's a part, it's a part of it. Okay. It's because otherwise you cannot find lock, uh, maximum function. Right. Uh, okay, so, okay, let me just quickly go through this. Uh, uh, to sort of the table. So what we have here is, if you look at the bottom three uh, lines, you see the joint distribution of um, uh, gamma and eta. So for example, if we look at people with the lowest fixed productivity gamma L, then 13% of them are of the worst health stack. But if you look at people with the highest fixed labor productivity gamma H, only 4% of them uh, is in the, uh, of the worst health stack. So a, a similar story, if you look at the, at the best health type, ADA3, much more people of the best health type among high labor productivity type. So that, there is correlation, uh, but by the way, it's also not uh, extremely high. So you, it's definitely two different fixed factors. You cannot say just one, some fixed factor, which affects everything. It's two distinct things. Okay, so now the another quite important implication of our estimation is how is um, uh, health transition behave? I'm going to show you uh, this for transition for poor to poor to see the effect of duration dependence. Uh, here, we fixed health type. So this is just for people with the same health type, eight or two, which is middle health type. And this is the uh, evolution of our age that probability moves to poor to poor health. So, uh, and three lines here correspond to different history. So the bottom line, tau B equal one, correspond to situation when you just get sick, so your history is just one. And the top line corresponds to uh, three or longer. This is capped at three, uh, is a T equal three estimation. Obviously, you see a big difference here. Uh, that, for example, if you take a 60 year old person who has been, who just fall sick, he has uh, a little bit like over 40% probability to, to recover. But if he's uh, already been in bad health for three D periods or longer, his probability not to recover, to stay, to stay in poor health, his probability to stay in poor health jump 
to 60%. So 40% versus 60%, one period versus three periods. So quite noticeable difference. But let us compare this with the effect of health type. So this time we fix duration at three periods. So these are old people, old people who have been in the health for three periods or longer. Um, but this time we look at the difference in health types. Uh, bottom, bottom line, best health type 803, top line, uh, worst health, health type 801. Now compare the same 60 old uh, person. If you compare the same 60 old person here, if he is of the best health type, he has maybe roughly 30% probability to stay in poor health next period, while he is in the worst, uh, worst health type, it's almost 90%, so three times um, uh, larger. So clearly by comparing these two uh, graphs, you can see that uh, contribution of health type to the um, variation in health transition is much more important than contribution of health history. And this is not just uh, poor to poor, uh, it's uh, here we have some additional graph, poor to good, good to, to good. We also have all these graphs, of course, in the paper where we have other health uh, states. So these results are always there. Health type are more important in generating variation in health transition than health history, meaning also that people who uh, spend a lot of time being unhealthy with longer unhealthy spell are people predominantly with bad health type. That's, that's what accounts for really long spells of bad health. Okay, so let me now move to our model. So, um, so the model we have, so we constructed the structural model, um, which in some ways standard, but of course it has interaction of health and economic outcome. So the model, as I already mentioned, we have channel one and channel three. Channel one is, there is this health which evolves in this complex way that I just have described to you. And what happens to you if your health becomes bad? Uh, your productivity goes down, your disutility goes up from work, disutility from work goes up, medical spending go, go up, and uh, your life expenses expectancy goes down. In addition, there is channel three, which we also going to refer occasionally as compositional effect, which uh, what, what we have here, as I already told you in the beginning, three-dimensional heterogeneity, health type, fixed productivity, and patients. Correlation between health type and fixed labor productivity we have estimated at the previous, uh, in the previous part of the paper during our estimation of health uh, shock process. And uh, we're going to estimate correlation between beta and health type inside the, the structural model. So people in the, in the model enter at age 21. Uh, the, uh, and the model 65 retired, 91, uh, they are dead for sure. Um, mo model period is, is two years. Three health types, similar to what we have in, a, in the health shock uh, process estimation, discount factor, uh, we allow for two values, low and high patient and patient with probability among them, possibly non-zero. Um, in addition to health shock, there is shock and productivity, medical expenditures, and uh, survival. I will talk a little bit more about working age person problem for retired people. I'm not going to really talk much because their problem is much simpler. They just receive social security benefit and their health insurance is government health insurance, Medicare. So what's going on for the young people? Let's, let's look at the young person with a particular combination of this eta, gamma and beta who enters period or HT with some asset that he saved from previous period KT. And uh, he learns his health condition and updates his health history in the beginning. He learns his labor productivity Z, which depends on his age and health. And he learns whether or not he has options by employers to sponsor insurance. So in US, you are not uh, like most people or young people get employer-based insurance, but it's not really universal. So we model it as a stochastic process G, which depends on age, health, and productivity. Having all this information, he decides labor supply L and health insurance I. Uh, he can stay to be uninsured. He can buy individual insurance. If this uh, type of private insurance not linked to, to employer. And he can buy employer sponsored insurance if here he actually has an option. After this out of pocket medical shock X uh, is realized, which depends on HT and health H. And uh, part of the shock is covered. We did not the coverage of CVG, which depends on the size of the shock and on health insurance. So obviously, if you're uninsured, it's not uh, it's zero. 
And at this point, some people may receive government transport to just because if you are hit by super high medical shock until your consumption uh, is quite low or is negative, you receive transfer from the government. Then consumption saving decisions are made and survival shock is realized. This probability D, which depends on age and health you survive and everything starts all over. Or uh, if a person dies, he enjoys utility from bequest, which models in a standard way bequest is a luxury good. For person who is alive, so here in the bottom of the slide is a flow utility at the state of in the state of being alive, which has three components in it. The first component is standard CRA function uh, of consumption, which has a risk aversion role. This, uh, this three uh, parts is uh, this utility from work. So if you work, you have fixed utility cost. If you have poor uh, fair health and you work or poor health and you work, this increases potentially. Uh, this is going to be estimated. And uh, the last part here is a positive constant B bar. So if you don't have this constant B bar, this whole thing, as long as the risk aversion is above one, is negative, meaning that basically people are better off being dead than being alive in many cases. And in our uh, study, we want to understand the consequence of be, being uh, unhealthy. If people are really happy to be dead, they will be actually very happy to be unhealthy because that means they're going to die sooner. To prevent this from happening, we add this constant B to make sure that the utility of being alive is positive, and this is basically a standard approach in literature studying longevity issues. Okay, so we estimate the model um, using standard approach. Uh, we estimate certain parameters outside the model uh, at the first stage, and then we estimated uh, some parameter inside the model at, at the second stage. And um, of course, the model is large, has a lot of parameters. So I, I'm not going to go through all of them due to the lack of time, but I do want to show you some, some parameters. So first, what about the beta? So our uh, estimated beta are quite different. So what we call impatient people beta is 0.77, patient people beta is 0.99. And importantly, this beta turned out to be correlated with uh, health type. For example, if you look at the worst health type, eta 1, 78% of these people have low beta. Uh, so they are impatient. While among the best health type, uh, less than 40% are impatient. So there is clearly uh, a large correlation, and these are all identified from uh, wealth profiles over life cycle and uh, wealth difference by health over the life cycle. So B. So how did we pin down B? So this B that makes your utility of life being positive affects this parameter, uh, this uh, statistical statistical value of life. This uh, basically marginal rate of substitution between wealth and survival. How much you essentially are willing to pay to marginally increase your survival probability. And it's estimated. Uh, there are many many estimates of this, in, in especially in labor literature, uh, with very big variation from one to sixty million. We try to be conservative, picking up low value of 2 million, but we also have an appendix of our paper, uh, all the results when we set it to high value. So if you would like to see those, uh, I review to that appendix. So, okay, so I'm going to show you, hopefully, um, three sets of results. The first result uh, is the compositional difference, how important it is, or put differently, how important is the correlation between beta and eta. To show you this result, so what we did, so we have set, re-estimated the model by setting this correlation to a 0.5. So basically, it does not matter uh, uh, what health type you are, you always have 50-50 probability to be patient or impatient. And then we re-estimated the model. So what we have here, this table shows wealth by health in thousands of US dollar for at 3% house of wealth distribution, 25th, medium, and 75th percentile. So uh, this is the data, and baseline model here is in blue, and we target those moments, that's why they're close to the data. But I really want you to pay attention to this last, uh, last um, column. Here, we shut down this beta data correlation. So, as you can see, we still have wealth health gradient there. So there is correlation between wealth and health, but this uh, model cannot account for wealth health gradient at all. It falls far short. And importantly, this model, the model with uh, 
no correlation between beta and eta. People who become sick, they still have higher medical spending. They have low life expectancy. They have low productivity. In fact, the model completely reproduces the income health gradient, the disparity in economic uh, in, in income by health, the one that I told you in the beginning of the presentation. But it it cannot replicate this particular dispersion in wealth outcomes by health. So this correlation is quite important, especially to account for uh, for for this uh, outcome. Can I ask yeah. kind of the same question? In, uh, if you had more health types than just three, would that help kind of help replace the data heterogeneity potentially? Like, is it is it that you need more than three? Uh, well, for beta heterogeneity, basically, we just uh, we, we are matching quite seriously matching the wealth inequality, and in, in this case, you do need if you, when you match uh, wealth inequality over life cycle. So basically, by this, I mean if you just match wealth inequality over the aggregate everyone in the economy and match wealth inequality, you don't need much beta heterogeneity. But if you look at moments conditional on age, you will see that you need quite a big heterogeneity in beta. So those papers that do much that, regardless of of health, they typically have, like Cormac has, a, has an interesting paper, which he also finds quite a good heterogeneity in, in beta um, if he match wealth inequality by, uh, by age. As for health type, we actually, in a previous paper, we have five health type. We, we still have the same result, heterogeneous beta and strong correlation between beta and eta. So it, it doesn't really change this that much. Okay, so next, uh, uh, now the, the second question we ask is what is the monetary cost of bad health? So first, we're going to only uh, basically focus on how much money you actually lose because you're unhealthy. But we are looking not just one period, uh, but over the entire life. So how we uh, measure it? So we construct what we call always healthy counterfactual. So... Um, we take this, the person who lives through his life, has certain realization of uh, health over life cycle. Some of them, are, uh, he, he had some spells of bad health. And then we can uh, put him in this counterfactual environment that he just becomes super lucky. So he only draws good health realization, never draw, have unlucky draw. We don't change the process itself. We don't change his expectation. We just change his luck, essentially. And then, so this represents like super lucky benchmark. And then we, we compare your actual kind of situation with the super lucky benchmark and see how bad off you, you could actually be if you're a very lucky person. So uh, what we did next, we compute this Y, which is income net of total medical expenses in the baseline case and also in healthy cases. We call it a YBS and YH. And then we just computed present discount value of this. Uh, and uh, compute the average over uh, the time that you are alive. And here's the result. So first I want you to, to, to look at, at, at the second, uh, second row of this table, which actually uh, report this result. So average uh, cost of bad health is around one and a half thousand per year. So this is annual cost. On average, people lose one and a half thousand per year because they draw bad health realization. If you look, though, at the health type, difference by health type, you see huge difference. So, for example, uh, uh, worst health type almost loses 9,000 per year, by, uh, while the losses of best health type are quite, quite small. Now, why is that? Why there is such a big difference? And for that, uh, it's actually quite helpful to look at the first row. So the first row reports the fraction of your lifetime, the percentage of your lifetime that you've been unhealthy. Overall, people spend around 50% of their time being unhealthy. But this mask huge heterogeneity. If you look at the worst health type, more than half of their life, close to 60%, they've been unhealthy. Well, their life is also relatively short. It's also important to keep in mind. But overall, out of their relatively short life, or almost 60%, they are sick. If you look at um, uh, best health type, only 4%. So that's why this uh, monetary cost of bad health differs so much by, uh, by type. If you look at the composition also, so if you look at what actually constitutes this uh, monetary cost, uh, we can see that income losses are the largest component of out-of-pocket losses. Out-of-pocket medical uh, spending is 27% of these losses and roughly so discovered by health insurance. Now, 
And the next exercise is basically we also con construct uh, the measure of uh, cost of bad health, but this time it's even more comprehensive measure. So this time it's a welfare cost of bad health where we include both monetary costs and um, the utility of welfare costs. So how exactly we do this? So again, we place individual in this always healthy counterfactual and compare him with the baseline case. So uh, the baseline case, his realized utility is this. So this is realized utility and individual have lived for TD years. TD is the age of death. Uh, this was his flow utility every period was he was alive, and this was his final utility when he was he died and left bequest. And C style star uh, K star are his optimal choices. Then we can uh, compute this utility for uh, this person when he never draws back health realization. He probably will die later, so he has new age of the TDG. He will have different uh, choices, so he, we, we, we call it C double style, double star, K double star. So, of course, if you never draw bad health realization, you have high utility. So what we did, we scaled down his consumption every period by lambda C, and we scale it down until we, we drag his utility back to the baseline case. And we say how, how big this lambda C should be so that your utility in the baseline case is the same as your utility in, a, in a, um, uh, this contrafactual uh, never unhealthy case. So we, we solve this equation. And then we report this sample here in dollar terms. And here, what you can see is on average people, uh, the annual, annual consumption equivalent variation is around $2,000. Uh, again, there is a big difference by type with more than 6,000 for lowest type and uh, 800 for for the for the worst uh, for the best time. Another interesting question, though, is why why it the, this consumption equivalent variation is high? What really matters a lot for people in terms of uh, this bad health shock? So we constructed this reconstructual to to figure it out. So remember, health affects people through multiple channels, through medical spending, through labor productivity, and through survival. We shut down all channels but one and recompute this consumption equivalent variation and compute it as a fraction of the baseline number. And what you can see here, um, the largest component here is survival channel. So because of survival channel, people are willing to pay a lot for, uh, not willing to pay, but people's consumption equivalent variation is high. Uh, income channel is closely followed and medical spending is least important, but there is variation by type. This, for example, uh, income channel be more important for, for the lowest type and best type. For them, survival channel is more important. So that three so minutes, okay. Uh, also, let me very quickly show you the contribution of health type to this lifetime cost of bad health. So uh, let me just go through only the last uh, uh, column of this table. So this column shows the contribution of, of eta to variation in this uh, lifetime cost of bad health, both in monetary and welfare uh, term. So what you can see here is quite remarkable. So almost 70% of variation in monetary cost of bad health uh, is due to, to ATA, to health stack, and 30% uh, for welfare costs. In other words, when you are born to, to a significant extent, it already predetermines what's going to be your lifetime cost of bad health, especially if we're talking about monetary costs. For welfare costs, it's somewhat lower, and the reason being that, uh, remember I showed you um, several slides ago that uh, monetary costs uh, differ a lot depending on how many periods uh, of life people spend being unhealthy. So health type is very important to account for that variation. That's why it's also very important to account for monetary cost variation. But for, some, uh, for the welfare cost, it's very important how long you're gonna live. And here health type contributes less to that variation, that's why they contribute less to the variation in uh, welfare cost. So, okay, so let me conclude. So we construct a rich structural model which can account for many important facts, in particular, long-run health dynamic and disparity economic outcome by health. And we show that uh, fixed expansive heterogeneity and its correlation among each other is very important to account for the uh, disparity economic outcomes by health, especially for wealth health gradient. And then we use the model to, 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 to construct several uh, measurements 
we find that both uh, monetary and welfare costs of bad health are very important, and also that to a large extent they are predetermined by your health staff. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. First, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. Uh, it was a pleasure to read, and I will start using health type uh, definitely in my research. Uh, that is not the only contribution. Uh, the paper has two important contributions. The first is how to model health with duration dependent and uh, the reach ex ante heterogeneity with respect to health types, labor productivity, and time preferences, which are correlated with each other. And the second is estimating the effect of health on earnings, wealth, uh, and welfare over the life cycle across different types. So my first set of comments is with respect to the value of statistical life. Uh, so B is necessary uh, in order to solve the model in models with endogenous mortality. Otherwise, the indifference curve do not have the correct shape. Uh, and it's estimated in order to mask the implied value of statistical life. In models where there is a health production function and health is endogenous, uh, one way to do that is to use the inverse of the marginal effect of uh, health, health spending on uh, life expectancy. Uh, in this model, if you change B, this constant in the utility, then the optimal allocation is going to change. And this is what we care about. We want to target a specific level of healthcare spending that is close to the willingness to pay in order to increase survival. In this paper, however, B doesn't have any effect on the optimal allocation uh, directly. It doesn't affect the decision for consumption saving and uh, labor supply. There is an indirect effect because the paper targets a specific value of uh, statistical life uh, because we want a certain level of consumption, labor supply, uh, and savings. But plugging back the implied value of B doesn't change the allocation. The direct effect is with respect to the welfare uh, calculations. So the rationale is that beyond the loss of consumption and leisure, there, there is an additional cost of mortality, which is the value of uh, being alive. My first question is whether uh, with this method of estimating the value of statistical life, we double count what is the welfare loss of bad health. Uh, because in the absence of a health production function, we need to use the marginal rate of substitution between the probability of survival and assets. And in the denominator, essentially, uh, we take into account what is the effect of mortality on the loss of consumption, leisure, uh, and the bequest model that we have here, which is already present in the value fun in the utility function itself. Uh, the second question is, what does the distribution of the value of statistical life look like uh, since there are bequests in this uh, model? And the extremely wealthy are going to have a lesser impact of mortality. They are going to get some utility from their bequest. But in this uh, model, bequests are irrelevant for uh, poor wealth, uh, poorer individuals. Uh, if I remember correctly, the, the threshold is $50,000 uh, in assets. Uh, and I wonder whether this uh, creates a counterintuitive distribution for the value of statistical life. So I would suggest, uh, see, in the lack of better measure for uh, this class of models where health is exogenous, to use the value of statistical life as an external validation instead of as a target to evaluate what is the cost of uh, mortality for welfare. Use that measure directly. The second uh, set of questions uh, is with respect to labor income. The first part was uh, discussed with uh, uh, John and uh, Karen. Uh, I would like to see an alternative estimation for the labor income process in this model because it's so central. Uh, I think it should be estimated outside the model, especially the selection uh, into employment. Uh, sacrifice some uh, fitness to have a more accurate estimation about what's the causal effect of health on labor income. Uh, irrespectively of the estimation, I would also like to see a clear decomposition of the effect of the distribution of the SOFs and the effect of health on productivity. Because in the counterfactual, where everyone is lucky throughout the life cycle, there are two differences across health types. It's both the distribution of the health shocks and a different effect of uh, each health shock on labor productivity. So it's very, uh, it's very hard to disentangle what is the magnitude of a specific health shock on labor productivity. 
which is important in this paper because it demonstrates that some of the variation in health comes from health types. So I guess that the effect is going to be lower here because we don't assign all the variation of the uh, labor income because of health shocks. Some of these differences in income come from health types. So I would like to have a sense of magnitude with respect to, to that. Uh, also, I would like to uh, see an, a, a different estimation of the model with college graduates, uh, because we know that the effect of uh, health on labor income for college graduates it doesn't have the same magnitude, it's lower. Uh, whether it's true in this uh, health process, with this ex ante type, is going to be very interesting for welfare and to explain what is the welfare cost of uh, bad health. Uh, I have one very, very quick, I know there are many questions. So I have one very quick comment. So I'm very, uh, I'm completely sold about the fixed types. I'm not that convinced that in the presence of fixed types, we need duration dependent. The relative magnitude of the explanation for the variance of the health over the life cycle is it's much uh, smaller. And we need to have three periods of dependence to see any uh, significant effect on the transition probabilities. Uh, and it's also, to me at least, counterintuitive that we need three periods uh, when each period the model is two years. To me, if someone is uh, sick for four years, it looks more like a type than duration dependent. Intuitively, for me, duration dependence has to do with comorbidities. If you get sick this period, your immune system is compromised, you are more likely to get sick uh, again and again. But when someone is, uh, needs to be sick in order to get uh, some action with respect to probabilities for four years, uh, and considering the computational cost of including uh, this duration dependent, uh, I think it's not that important in, uh, for the results of the paper.